Hello and welcome to Wildside. This is your host, Caitlin Kite, and that was Nico Case singing Things That Scare Me. And in the spirit of the Halloween festival that is today, I'm going to be doing a broadcast all about the science of monsters. And Nico has gotten us in the mood. I think also the weather is getting us in the mood. It's quite windy and dark and rainy, and it's perfect to think about all the things that do scare us. So first of all, I'll start off with ghosts. And I should say, actually, before I get too far into all these details, that some of this stuff that I'm going to be talking about is actually from real scientific studies. And some of the things I'll be mentioning are scientists who have just thought about some theories behind why we might have some of the, uh, the monsters that we supposedly have. So you should take all of this with a grain of salt, because some of it is quantifiable evidence, some of it is just kind of fun and theoretical and uh, just kind of thought-provoking, so don't take anything too seriously or get too upset. All right, so to start us off, ghosts. Now, one of the great first scientific endeavors into looking at ghosts actually happened in the late 1950s. And there was a scientist named Vladimir Gavreau who was working in a robotics lab late at night. And prior to this, this particular event that set him off and got him interested in studying ghosts, there had been a lot of weird things happening in the robotics lab. First of all, there were some assistants that were suddenly bleeding from their ears out of nowhere. There were also um, some people who would work in the lab and feel quite uncomfortable, physically ill. They would feel nauseous, maybe a bit uh, nervous about things. And after doing a set of experiments, Vladimir found out that this was because there was a, a lot of vibrations. There, sorry, bad grammar. There were a lot of vibrations in the laboratory. And these seemed to be coming from the pipes. And in fact, certain lengths and girths of pipes were causing specific types of vibrations. And so he found that depending on the, the characteristics of the pipes themselves, you had different effects that would range from mild to serious. So some people would just experience some irritation, whereas other people would be quite at the far end of the spectrum and have actual pain. And oddly enough, um, Vladimir in some way could be thought of as a monster himself because he actually went and kind of sneaked up behind people in the lab and would hold these vibrating pipes behind them and see what effect they would cause. It's not very ethical, obviously. And so there he would be causing these poor people to have pain and bleeding from the ears, and he would just be holding that pipe behind their heads. But he found that in addition to these kind of physical things, so obviously blood would be quite an uh, an obvious physical problem. Uh, he found emotional symptoms as well, so things like fear and dread and panic that were uh, very much like what people had previously reported as these signs of discomfort that they had while they were in the laboratory. And it turned out that all these symptoms were resulting from infrasound. And infrasound is very low frequency noise that is not something that we consciously hear, so we don't process it once um, those sound waves are picked up and, and put into our ears through the air, but we still do have a physical experience of sensing them. So the sound wave goes through the air, it's picked up by our, our ear hairs, um, and they move and they do cause this kind of physical reaction in our bodies, but then that's not really translated into a neurological reaction that enables us to say, oh, I hear something and it must be X, Y, or Z. And this is actually something uh, it, it ranges from about 7 to 19 hertz uh, in this wavelength area that actually can cause us to have these really uncomfortable sensations. And these result from things that are subconsciously processed and but not really, uh, really thought about or assigned a meaning to in some way. And that's an instinctual thing because actually infrasound results from lots of things out in nature that we would need to be aware of and be quite wary of. So things like volcanoes and earthquakes ocean waves, wind, and also even some predator animals, such as tigers. So all these things can cause infrasound, and obviously if humans can detect that, even if we can't quite assign a meaning to it or figure out where it's coming from, it would be to our benefit to have this um, evolved response where we'd be quite nervous and maybe leave the environment, because then that would get us away from these things that are particularly dangerous. Now more recently, scientists have followed up on Vladimir's work by um, doing a number of things, both in a laboratory setting and also out in the real world. And again, there are some, some poor unsuspecting souls that were involved in some of these experiments. So a few years ago, there were some scientists who in inserted some infrasound noises 
into a live music concert, and they didn't tell uh, the bulk of the people who were attending the concert. So what they wanted to do was just have everyone think that they're listening to nice classical music, and then every now and then there would be some infrasound that obviously they wouldn't consciously hear, and so the scientists then wanted to monitor what their reaction was to that and survey people afterwards and say, how did you feel during this concert? And it turned out that nearly a quarter of people reported having feelings of sudden dread and chills and depression and other things that they couldn't quite explain. And interestingly, you know, only one quarter of people felt this, the other three quarters didn't. And so the people who did the study think that this is probably a result of the fact that we all have physical differences and so some of us are going to be able to pick up on these noises better than others, just as some of us have better hearing in the regular range than other people do. And so that would explain why some people have ghost encounters while other people don't have ghost encounters. And that also explains these otherwise um, nonsensical changes that we have in mood, so these feelings of dread and chills and depression that are often reported with ghost encounters. But all of that only, only encompasses part of the experience of having a haunting. Because lots of people not only say that they feel quite uncomfortable, but they also report actually seeing ghosts. And you have to say it's, it's going to be pretty hard to manufacture something uh, if people are actually literally seeing a ghost. How can you explain that? Well, that's where Vic Tandy comes in. And he's an engineer who worked in a supposedly haunted building. So just like in Vladimir's robotics lab, there were people who were reporting these really uncomfortable sensations, so feelings of dread and depression, the feeling of being watched, and some people also would experience uh, dark figures that they would see in their periphery. And in fact, the people um, who worked in this lab went through a series of cleaning ladies who all quit because they had had uncomfortable encounters with what they described as a ghost that would suddenly appear and watch them in the hallway before disappearing again. And of course, someone like Vic Tandy, an engineer, a scientist, is very skeptical about this. But late one night, he was working on a project, and all of a sudden, he started feeling incredibly uncomfortable. And he got a feeling of chills and kind of panic, and he definitely felt as though he was being watched, even though he knew without a doubt that he was alone in the lab. And all of a sudden, he saw a figure emerge in the periphery of his vision, a dark figure that just stood there silently next to him. And so eventually, he got up the courage to turn his head and look, and there was nothing there at all. And of course, this not only terrified him, and he did admit that he was utterly terrified, but it also piqued his curiosity, because as a scientist, he felt that there had to be some rational explanation for this. And so he started testing various characteristics of the lab, things that would explain why something might have gone wrong in his brain, so gas levels, or equipment malfunctions, maybe there were electrical discharges, or something messing up his brain activity. And as he was wandering around the lab, he found one section to be the busiest, as he described it. For example, one day he was working on some metal sheet, and he left it in a vise for a minute and then ran to get a tool. And when he came back, the whole metal sheet was just vibrating for no reason at all, all by itself. And this is really kind of a breakthrough for him because it helped him discover a, a supposedly silent exhaust fan. And this fan had recently been installed, and it was sending out low-frequency vibrations. And these passed back and forth between the lab's walls, and the, the, all the reverberation and the fact that it was contained between the two walls meant that it formed this standing wave at approximately 19 hertz, that same infrasound region that is what was found earlier on by Vladimir Gavro to cause these feelings of panic and discomfort. And so... Here he had this explanation of, of why it was that in particular parts of the lab things were worse, and that's because these parts of the lab were falling within the area where the waves were just standing in place as it was maintained by echoes, basically, from the two walls around it. And knowing this, uh, Vic then started going back into the scientific literature and finding things that might have to do with uh, waves at this frequency, and he also looked at um, standing waves, and just anything that might relate some sort of ghost-like experience with the fact that this was occurring in the lab. And he came across a NASA study that found that this particular wavelength resonated with the average human eyeball, and it caused smeared vision. And so this happens because the eye vibrates, and that 
causes it to register something that's static, so maybe your glasses, if you're wearing glasses, you might see at the periphery, uh, the frame, or a dust particle, or any old thing that's just kind of there in the air or in, on your eye itself. And because the eye is vibrating, it puts all those little particles together and actually sees them as one big solid thing. And, and that makes it a large shape and also a moving shape, and it tends to make it a dark shape because it's going to show up dark um, against the lighter background. And so that's going to make it look as though you're seeing a ghost. And that particularly would explain why a lot of people see things out of the side of their vision and turn their head and no longer see the ghost anymore. And so having, having tracked all this down, Vic Tandy uh, asked people to come in and remove the vibrating fan. And this did, in fact, remove all of the ghost encounters. No one felt uncomfortable anymore. They didn't go through any more cleaning ladies. But not satisfied with this, Vic wanted to test his theory uh, somewhere else and see if this was just a, a one-off occurrence explained by this one particular fan, or whether it maybe could be a phenomenon that uh, applied to other haunted areas as well. And so he did some research and came up with a haunted abbey. And in particular, the cellar of this abbey was haunted. And people would see gray figures in the abbey and they would become quite nauseous. And this was particularly strong as soon as they entered the doorway of the cellar. And when Tandy went in and took a bunch of measurements, he found out that the cellar was acting like a resonating chamber, and it was full of vibrations at 19 hertz. And this, these were particularly strong in the doorway, which would explain why so many people would get that far and then just be totally overwhelmed by this feeling of dread and have to flee. And in fact, he found that in general, if you've got any sort of long, narrow space, that tends to act very well as a resonating chamber and cause these infrasound uh, frequencies to kind of collect and reverberate and cause us discomfort. And if you think about a lot of the places that have um, hauntings reported, they're places that are old and so they have narrow hallways, they have small little spaces, they have maybe the right sorts of materials to reflect sound quite well. And so they're really perfect places to have accumulations of these sorts of events. And one interesting thing is actually the government, uh, multiple governments, are aware of the fact that infrasound is quite unnerving to humans. And they've known this for quite a while. And the U.S., for example, blasted infrasound at the Viet Cong during the Vietnam War. And instead of finding that it made them quite scared and would make them uh, submit to us, they, they found that it actually panicked people and they would go completely crazy and, and run out with their guns firing. And so that was quickly abandoned. In the UK, uh, infrasound has been used to control pest species, so they would just blast out infrasound in order to scare off animals like crows that weren't wanted. Um, but all of this kind of thing requires very large and very powerful equipment, and it also doesn't affect everyone in quite the same way. So having ghosts as kind of a tool is probably not something that we're going to see anytime soon. And that was Ghosts by the Tony Rich Project. And we are having a Halloween special here on the Wild Side today. And we have just talked about the science behind why it is that we might see ghosts. And now I'm going to venture even farther into unknown territory and talk about zombies. Because really there aren't any good scientific explanations uh, for, for the, th the phenomenon of zombies because we don't have any sorts of of good evidence about how these might be perceived by humans because obviously they we don't have really any good examples so with ghosts you have pictures and videos and supposed real occurrences unexplained phenomenon but with zombies uh, as far as i know no one's actually seen a quote unquote real one yet however there are lots of of near zombies or kind of faux zombies and they give us an idea about how the the phenomenon might actually arise if eventually things go wrong and evolution kind of takes over, some crazy mutation happens. And so buckle yourselves in because this, this next little section is going to be a bit theoretical. So how might the zombie legend have come about to begin with? What are some things that people might have seen in the real life or some real life things that could happen that might actually facilitate the generation of zombies in the real world? Well, um, I've stumbled across a really interesting place where some some 
I guess you would call them conspiracy theorists, have found some great examples of real things that have actually happened over the years. And they've kind of begun to put two and two together and see how maybe eventually this could lead uh, to the creation of zombies. And one thing that they started off with was pointing out arsenic. So arsenic you'll probably have heard of is a poisonous element that's long been used actually in embalming bodies and also in killing people. <clears throat> and it actually was found to keep bodies looking quite lifelike for a really long time. So if you smother bodies and fill bodies with enough arsenic, they can actually remain fresh for over a hundred years. And this is not just a, a crazy fact that someone made up. There are actually bodies that were carried around and put on display for this length of time. Uh, so for example, there was a really famous circus sideshow for over almost a hundred years where this person had died and been embalmed and was carried around and set up in a tent so that people could come in and, and see the perpetually young and undecomposing dead body. And the thing with arsenic is that it prevents decomposition, so your tissues will stay the same, but it does not prevent the growth of mold. And so what you would have was a body that would look quite normal, except for it would start turning kind of greenish as a sheen of mold would start to grow on the skin. And obviously this would kind of mimic what we think of as, as zombies, um, because zombies often are depicted as having kind of a greenish tinge or a very strange looking kind of pale skin tone. And actually, uh, arsenic at one point was used to make green dyes, but despite this, it could color people kind of a yellowy green sort of hue. So people would look quite strange. Uh, they, they might have been preserved, but they did look quite unnatural and have a very strange pallor. And one thing that people have uh, supposed is that maybe uh, this actually was used for a very long time, until the early 20th century. So what you would have is this buildup of non-decomposing bodies. And as I said, some of these were put on display. So potentially someone with a quite good imagination, or maybe someone who was having a, a walking dream, or was on drugs, or having some other pleasant, unpleasant experience, might come across one of these collections of non-decomposing bodies. Maybe they're at the circus, or they wandered into a graveyard, or a mortuary, or something. And you could see how the, that would spark the imagination, where you would have these people that looked like they were um, dead, but really not quite dead, maybe still partially alive. Another thing that uh, people have come up with as an explanation for why they might have thought of zombies and how they might actually eventually evolve is the brain parasites. And there are, in fact, many parasites known in nature that can alter the behavior of their hosts and get them to act in a way that they wouldn't ordinarily. So, for example, you've probably heard of Toxoplasma gondii, and this is something that infects rats. And it infects rats so that it can get to where it really wants to go, which is the intestines of cats, and because that's where this toxoplasma can reproduce. So rats are just really a carrier, um, and obviously the rats are helpful in this respect because cats will generally try to kill and eat rats, and when they ingest the tissue, that means that the toxoplasma goes with it and is right there in the intestines where it wants to be. And so rats that are infected, infected with toxoplasma will deliberately expose themselves to cats, um, so not only do they no longer show the fear that they should show, but they actually will then deliberately go and approach cat urine or uh, cats themselves if they're around, and they will then put themselves into the position of being killed by the cats. And this happens because you've got the toxoplasma taking over with the neurological processes and causing uh, differences in the way that chemicals are produced and uptaken in the brain. And so basically it's uh, manipulating the brain chemistry of the rat and t telling it to ignore its fear, to no longer have fear. And in fact, there are lots of different estimates, but anywhere from a third to a half uh, to more than, than that number of people are also carriers of toxoplasma. And I don't say this to scare you, uh, it's just kind of a, a fact, and that happens because we do live in quite close proximity with cats, and this is something that also can kind of just get kicked up in the air from wildcats as well. And so um, many of us are carriers, and that means that theoretically, if it should happen to evolve and manage to survive in that evolved state, then maybe we could eventually have these parasites that are also controlling our own brain chemistry. And in fact, there is some sign of this already. 
So researchers have found that people who have toxoplasma in their brains tend to have slightly different personalities. So in men, you find that infected men tend to be a bit more jealous and suspicious, but in women, you tend to find that, that when they're infected, they become more warm and outgoing. So kind of something uh, with the women, like what we saw in the rats. And there have e even been some theories that potentially toxoplasma is related to schizophrenia. Now another uh, important brain parasite that's been studied in the wild is the cordyceps fungi. And this is a whole suite of, of fungus species. And these guys infect ants. And this is really a crazy thing. And you have to feel sorry for the poor ants. Because when they're infected, the fungi will eat them from within. So basically, they focus on all of the non-essential organs. And they're eating the ants, but keeping the ants alive. And then when it's time for the fungi to, um, to reproduce, they grow into the ant's brain and release chemicals that tell the ant to, to go outside and climb a plant and attach itself near the top and then the fungus will put up its spores and it will release uh, its genes and then reproduce. And there are actually massive ant grave sites where many ants have gone to the same place to die each time there has been a wave of this fungus through the colony. And the fungus will sprout out the top of the ant's head. And if you look online, and I'll try to post one of these pictures on the Wildside website, you can actually see these amazing pictures of these big spikes of fungus that are growing straight out the top of an ant's head. And interestingly, cordyceps itself is also parasitized by another fungus. And this fungus can limit the ability of cordyceps to sporulate and infect new individuals. And that's why you don't have entire ant species wiped out by this all the time. You have these two fungi kind of working in concert to make sure that uh, the one fungus can keep some ants kind of in a zombie-like state without taking over all ants um, together. Now, given all my focus on kind of what's going on in the brain, you probably wouldn't be surprised to know that another theory for how zombies might form is some kind of manipulation of, of brain activity through neurotoxins. And there are certain chemicals that can make someone look dead. And if you've read or seen Romeo and Juliet, then you'll be familiar with this idea. So someone can take chemicals and, and get into a basically dead-like state and then take counter chemicals that will bring them back to life. And this actually does happen in real life. But in, in some cases, the counter chemicals will maybe bring you back, but not quite restore you to where you once were. So they can keep you in a trance-like state with no memory but basic functioning. And that sounds very much like what we think of when we think of zombies. You've got uh, human beings that are physically capable of kind of wandering around and doing things, but they're not really thinking in any serious way. And actually, as outlandish as this sounds, it actually was found to happen in real life. Uh, and it was found to happen in Haiti, which is, ironically, well, probably not ironically, where the word zombie comes from to begin with. So there was a case, actually not even that long ago, in the 1960s, of a man named Clairvius Narcisse. And he was a Haitian man who was, who was quote-unquote killed, um, but then brought back to life. So he was given tetrodotoxin and bufotoxin, and these are from pufferfish and toads, uh, respectively. And these mimicked death, although he was not actually dead. And so as far as his family knew, he was buried, and that was the end of the story. And then suddenly, 18 years later, they saw him again, and he just walked into town, and there he was, walking around alive. And it turned out, after uh, a, an investigation was conducted, that he had been revived with something called Datura stramonium. And if you'll remember uh, the show, if you heard the show that I did about plants, Datura is one of those plants that has actually quite a lot of toxic properties. And in fact, Datura, different species, can make you go insane. But in this case, what it did was basically keep you going, um, but unaware of anything, and not really in charge of your own activity. So you're basically vacant and trance-like. And in this condition, uh, given regular doses of this Datura, um, I believe it was in liquid form, Clairvius worked on a plantation for two whole years, basically as a slave, until the owner died. And at that point, the, the regular doses no longer stopped, and he slowly began to gain uh, his memory back. And it turned out that this whole scenario had been figured out by his brother, who was upset about um, some, some land rights issues. And so his brother went to a medicine man uh, who came up with this plan using some kind of traditional old school techniques, and they, they did this to Clairvius. 
And in fact, uh, the paper that reported this, which, which was an anthrop anthropological paper, reported that, that Clarivius was not the only person to whom this sort of thing happened. That in fact, at one point, there were many different people, uh, when the plantations were at, in, in need of having new workers, many people were subjected to a similar treatment so that the plantations could basically just have as many workers as they needed without having to worry about paying them all. Because if you're in a trance and you don't know what's going on, you're probably not going to demand a paycheck of any sort. Now, another interesting thing uh, that you might have seen in, if you're a, a connoisseur of, of zombie movies, which I admit I am, um, is a sort of rage virus. And this is something that you might be familiar with from movies like 28 Days. And now I'm getting really into the kind of hypothesizing phase here. But a rage virus is potential if you take, uh, th th sorry, there is a potential for something like a rage virus. If you take something like mad cow disease, um, and add some, some slight mutations. So we know with mad cow disease, or uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob as it's called in humans, it can cause changes in gaits, uh, hallucinations, lack of coordination, muscle twitching, jerks and seizures, delirium, dementia, a whole bunch of things that you might uh, kind of find familiar if you've watched zombies on screen. And if you've got something like this that kind of mutated so that it also affected serotonin uptake, then you would have someone who's quite zombie-like also in behavior. So serotonin is quite important for affecting um, your moods. So it can, it can regulate depression and anxiety and impulsive violence. And in fact, in rats that are lacking a serotonin receptor, uh, scientists have found that they're both very aggressive and they're very fast. So if you have this sort of thing kind of going on at the same time that you've got something kind of Creutzfeldt-Jakob-like, then you could have something that's quite uh, uncoordinated and twitchy and, and not walking very well, but also still kind of fast and violent. And that's very much like what we've seen uh, in some zombie movies. Now another really big stretch of the imagination is the idea of neurogenesis. And tissues, this, basically this is the idea that you can take tissues and, and grow them up whether that's on their own and then you can inject them or you can inject cells that will then in place in someone's brain start creating new tissues. And to some extent this is seen in patients with head injuries. So you can help, help these patients out by um, giving them stem cells, so their own stem cells that have been stored. And these can be grafted into their brains and help grow new tissues and help them recover. And sometimes they will have uh, partial recovery and sometimes they'll have total recovery. It really depends on the extent of the damage. So here you've got a situation when you've got something going on with the brain and you can alter it uh, by injecting some cells. Now on top of this we have also some ability to place bodies and suspended animation. So this is quite um, kind of a new thing and this is for short periods of time. And what happens in this case is that you replace blood with cool saline and then reverse the process again. And scientists have actually done this in dogs, and they found that um, they could keep the dogs dead for, uh, I think it was like a half hour or an hour. So they're clinically dead because they have no blood, their, their hearts are not beating, their brains are not working. And then they flush out that saline solution and bring the blood back in, and all of a sudden they're basically alive again. And so the idea here is that if you kind of put these two things together, uh, you could have an individual that has a body that has been brought back into life from suspended animation. And as long as you are able to get the brain stem working, whether that's by um, grafting in tissues or just kind of keeping that portion alive all along, you can have a body that was capable of movement but not really have any kind of mental faculty. And that, again, is what we see with zombies. So. Uh, one last thing, one possibility for how zombies might come about is the idea of the nanobots. And these sound absolutely crazy, and when I first read about these I thought this was made up, but apparently it's not. Uh, so there are these microscopic robots that researchers are working on that can build and repair connections in the brain. And scientists are working on this because it should help people who have damaged neural connections. So whether that's from an injury or from aging or whatever, you can put these tiny little robots in the brain and they can uh, find out where these connections are damaged and fix them and help bring back or uh, at least perpetuate brain functioning. And some of these actually have been found to operate post-death. So for up to a month at least, 
at, at our current level of kind of technological advancement, you've got these things that can function in a dead body for over a month. So here we have a situation where possibly you could have a body that is definitely dead, but then these nanobots are in the brain doing things and telling the brain to do things, and it could potentially keep the body kind of functionally alive, even though it's not alive in any sense that we might recognize. Now, amazingly enough, some scientists have taken zombies uh, seriously enough in order to do some mathematical modeling. And this is because a lot of people actually find that zombies are kind of a useful scenario to think about when you're trying to figure out how diseases might spread. So for example, you might have heard that the CDC has actually run a zombie emergency preparation course to try to just help people think, uh, if you're prepared for this crazy worst case scenario, then you're prepared for anything else that might actually happen in real life. And similarly, there's been a professor who had some students come to him and say, we want to do some mathematical modeling work on the science of zombies and figure out how humans could combat zombies, whether we could persist, uh, and then maybe turn that into something that could be published for use in a real-life scenario where you kind of take out zombie and put in whatever other disease or invasion might actually happen. And thanks to their modeling work, we have found that um, humans can only combat zombies if they are quick, if we humans are quick and aggressive. So if we let too many zombies come, come about, and if we're too gentle in our treatment of them, then they will overwhelm us. And subsequent refined models have found that humans would actually benefit from being quite a bit faster than zombies, having more skill, and also being able to learn about things. And zombies, because they don't have these advantages in, in most of the cases that we see in movies, they probably wouldn't do so well. And in fact, they would only win and, and I guess, put us into extinction if humans had low skill and weren't able to kind of out, outspeed and outthink the zombies themselves.